I'm so glad that you're able to join us this morning. I want to take a moment to say thank you to Mary Jane Bailey from our church for coming and singing for us this morning, that great old song, The Palms. And I want to thank our organist, Betty Lees, for coming to accompany her. And let me say thanks to my daughter, Kirsten, who's been doing the live stream for us every week, and my son, Nathaniel, who's way up in the sound booth running the sound system for us. But I also want to thank you, uh, and not just for joining us, but I want to thank you for all the kind comments you've been placing on my Facebook page about how much these online services have been a blessing to you. That is a real encouragement to me. So thank you uh, for that. If you'd be so kind this morning to take your Bible, if you have it handy, and I trust that you do, and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. That's where we'll be looking this morning. Luke, chapter 19. And then once you find Luke 19 in your Bible, uh, we'll be reading verses 28 through 38. So that's Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 38. And it says this, And when he had thus spoken, and of course this is Jesus, he, was, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. 
And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, uh, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Today, one week before Easter Sunday is, is what is known as Palm Sunday. And it's called that because of the palm branches used in Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem as recorded by John in John chapter 12 and verse 13. And the, this event is recorded not only by Luke, which we'll be looking at this morning, uh, but also by all the gospel writers. Now let's begin by looking at the setting and the scene of this story. Jesus and the disciples had come from Bethany to Jerusalem, about two miles from the south. And the triumphal entry took place just a few days before the most important of all the Jewish religious festivals, which was Passover. There were probably between 300,000 and 500,000 pilgrims in Jerusalem for the Passover. And there was a religious zeal pervaded the atmosphere. There was excitement and expectancy in the air. But I want to take your attention away from that festive multitude to what we're to call the submissive minority. Because in this story, as well as in the story of the crucifixion, there are drawn for us in God's Word several beautiful uh, pictures of submission, which is a quality highly valued by God. And so this morning, I want us to look at three illustrations of submission. But before we do, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and for the opportunity to look into it this morning. And we trust and pray that as we open the pages of your word that you will speak to each one of our hearts. And I pray that everybody listening will receive something that will be of help and blessing and encouragement in their walk with you. And then we also pray that if there's anyone listening who does not know Jesus as their Savior and Lord, we pray that today they would take that step of faith and open their heart and invite Jesus Christ to come in. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Now, the first illustration of submission that we see in this passage is the submission of Jesus to the will of the Father. In verse 28 of Luke 19, it says, And when he had thus spoken, he went before, and then notice this phrase, ascending up to Jerusalem. And I want you to notice that phrase, ascending up to Jerusalem, because although uh, it's, a, it's a very brief phrase, it is filled with meaning. For instance, in that phrase, there was the fulfillment of prophecy. Zechariah, the prophet, had centuries before in the Old Testament, wrote these words. Uh, Zechariah 9 9, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Jerusalem, O daughter of Zion, rather, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And so Christ fulfilled this prophecy precisely by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. But it was even more than just the fulfillment of that particular prophecy. It was also the fulfillment of a prophecy by Daniel. 
In Daniel chapter 9, we have the prophecy of the 70 weeks in which Daniel prophesied the exact day that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem as Israel's Messiah. So in that little phrase, ascending up to Jerusalem, we see the fulfillment of prophecy. But not only was there fulfillment of prophecy in that little phrase, but there was also danger in it. The last time Jesus had been in Jerusalem, there had been an attempt on his life that's described for us in John chapter 10. There, Jesus asserted the fact that he is God in no uncertain terms. And when he did, in John 10, 31, it says, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And later in that same chapter, we read that there was another attempt on his life, but that he escaped their grasp, it says in verse 39, and went to be with John the Baptist beyond the Jordan River. And from that point on, Jesus was in constant danger. And this danger increased after Lazarus was raised from the dead in John chapter 11. Now Jesus was safer, I guess we could say, in the countryside, away from Jerusalem, the center of the power of his enemies. But once he stepped foot in Jerusalem, the Jewish leaders would immediately plot to kill him. And yet here we read that he was ascending up to Jerusalem, knowing full well the danger that that act placed him in. You see, uh, there was a prophecy uh, concerning uh, uh, future uh, events uh, in the phrase ascending to Jerusalem, but there was also submission to the Father's will uh, in uh, that phrase. Not just prophecy, not just, just danger, but submission to the Father's will is in that phrase. This act of ascending up to Jerusalem would lead to the cross, which was the whole reason for his coming. Ahead would be the awful mental and emotional turmoil in the Garden of Gethsemane. Ahead would be the betrayal of Jesus by Judas uh, with a kiss. Ahead, the disciples of Jesus would uh, turn tail and run, and Peter would deny him three times. Ahead, would lay a mock trial and a kangaroo court. Ahead was the rejection of the multitude, which is mind-boggling. The same multitude that cried at the triumphal entry, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, would shout, crucify him, crucify him just a few hours later. Ahead lay shame and mistreatment, the mocking of the soldiers, the plucking out of the beard, the horrible beating by the Roman soldiers, the whipping with the cat nine tails, the crushing of the crown of thorns into Christ's holy brow. And ahead lay the cross, the agony, the suffering, the pain, the drink of vinegar and gall, the crowds mocking the spear in his side. And worst of all, ahead of him was that time when he, the holy, sinless, perfect, righteous, pure Son of God, would bear our sins on the cross. And God the Father would turn away from his son and pour out his righteous wrath for our sins upon him. And Jesus would utter those mournful words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And when Jesus ascended up to Jerusalem, he knew all of that was before him. And yet Jesus was still submissive to the will of the Father. Although in his human side, he dreaded what was to come. Uh, we know that from his prayer in the garden. In Luke 22, 42, he says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. But then he added these words, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Submission to the will of the Father. And perhaps no scripture shows us more the submissive heart of Christ than Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, where it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus was submissive to the will of the Father. We see that in the words, ascending up to Jerusalem. But the submission of Christ was not the only example of submission in this story. I want you to notice, secondly with me, the submission of the disciples to the will of the Savior. We see this in verses uh, 29 through 35. The disciples were given strange instructions about the cult. In Luke 19, verses 30 and 31, let's notice those again together. It says, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do you loose him? Then shall you say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. So the disciples willingly submitted to the command of their master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's fascinating to examine this passage of Scripture because in it can, uh, we can see some striking parallels to our responsibility to submit to Christ's great commission. For instance, in verse 30, Jesus said to his disciples, Go ye. And in his great commission to us, he commands each one of us, as reported in Mark 16, 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so we too have a go ye command. And then notice that Jesus says to them in verse 30, Ye shall find a cold. Jesus knew what the disciples would find. He knew exactly what was ahead. And he always knows all about what's ahead. And when it comes to us obeying the Great Commission, he already knows the people we will run into who we need to tell about Jesus Christ. And he prepares them for our witness and our testimony. And then you'll notice Jesus said to his disciples that they would find a cult tied. Tied. Can you not see represented here all of humanity in the bondage of sin? Where to go to those who are tied, who are bound, who are not free, with the message of the Savior who can set them free? Remember, Jesus said in John 8, 36, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And then Jesus said this cult would be one uh, whereon yet never man sat. That donkey was unbroken, unbroken. And so here is humanity, not just in the bondage of sin, but we see humanity's uh, stubborn, selfish, unbroken will. As described for us by the prophet Isaiah, when he wrote in Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. Stubborn, selfish, sinful, self-will. And the Apostle Paul describes it this way in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. He says, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And then in verse 18, he says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. And in verse 23, he says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that is the state of man left to himself. He is in the bondage of sin and is selfishly and stubbornly rebellious against God in his unbroken self-will. And then in verse 30 of our text, the next thing we see is Jesus told his disciples that when they found this colt, they were to loose him. And folks, when we lead sinners to Jesus, 
to the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ, when we tell them about him and his life-changing power, that's exactly what we do. We loose them. We emancipate them. In John 8, 32, it says, If uh, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And when we tell people about Jesus, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, and they respond to him in faith, then we free them from the prison of sin and judgment, and we liberate them from the chains of sin and Satan and self. And then you'll notice... Jesus told the disciples to bring him hither. That is, bring him to me. We don't bring people to the church for salvation because the church can't save them. We bring them to Jesus. We don't bring them to God's law to follow rules and ordinances and precepts and statutes to earn God's favor. We bring them to Jesus, where his mercy and grace is freely bestowed without charge. We don't bring them to a religion. We bring them to a relationship to Jesus, the only one who can forgive their sins, the only one who can give them eternal life, the only one who can assure them of heaven, the only one who can make them a child of God. People need Jesus and so we bring them to him. And then Jesus went on and said in verse 31, if any man ask you. Now there will always be public opinion, and it will never be totally sympathetic to the cause of Christ. Your sharing the gospel with others will sometimes fall on many deaf ears. Some might even mock and make fun. Some may oppose and contend and hinder. And in some lands, some people even persecute and oppress believers in Christ. But thankfully, some will listen. And that is our opportunity to share the good news of Christ. And then notice, Jesus instructed the disciples that if any man asked what they were doing, they were to say, the Lord hath need of him. Think of it. The Lord hath need of him. Not the Lord is going to punish him, which would surely be just and fair for every sinner on earth, but no, it's the Lord hath need of him. That is, God has a purpose in life for each one of us. And God's purpose for you is to live for him, and to serve him and to glorify him in your life. And when I saw these parallels, I was reminded that God tells us to go and proclaim the good news that Jesus can loose people from their sin and give them everlasting life and a future in heaven and peace and joy and fulfillment if they'll just put their faith and their trust in him. And folks, many are out there waiting to be freed. The question is, are we submissive enough to Christ and to his command to go and tell them? Jesus told these disciples exactly what to do with that little donkey, and they were submissive in every respect. And may God help us as believers to be submissive to, to go as Christ has commanded and tell others the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And so we see that Jesus was submissive to the will of the Father, and we see the disciples were submissive to the will of the Savior. But one more thing, and this is something we don't often think about. It's not something we usually focus on in this story. But the third thing I point out to you is the submission of the donkey to the Creator and King. Look at verses 35 through 38 once again. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now, at the descent 
of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The disciples brought this colt to Jesus, cast their garments on him, and Jesus sat on that colt. A cult on which never man sat before, according to verse 30. That is, as we said, it was not broken. And yet, when Jesus sat on it, it calmly carried Jesus into the city in the midst of that loud throng of people. You see, the most stubborn animal of all equine species is the donkey. Any farmer knows that the donkey has a reputation for being the most ornery, stubborn, hard-headed, contrary animal on the farm. And yet, we, uh, we have the stubborn will of a donkey totally submitted to Jesus. All of nature was submissive to Jesus. Think about the stories you read about him in the Gospels. Storms, the wind, the sea, fish, rocks. They were all subject to his will. Only mankind shakes his stubborn fist in the face of God in rebellion. And that's foolish and dangerous. God is your maker. He is the ultimate boss. And you can live in sin if you choose and reject God's free gift of salvation offered through his son Jesus, but someday a day of reckoning is coming. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And Paul says in Ephesians 2.4 that God is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. But in the verse just before that, he says, those without Christ are children of wrath under the condemnation of sin. You see, even a donkey submits to his creator. He listens to him. And so today, why don't you listen to him? And what does he want you to do? Jesus said in John 6, 40, and this is the will of him that sent me that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. God's will is that you believe on his Son, Jesus Christ, for salvation. And so as you listen to me today, I wonder, do you find yourself lost, bound by sin, Facing God's judgment? My advice to you, dear friend, is flee to the loving arms of Jesus, who will cleanse you from all sin and give you everlasting life if you'll just trust Him to do it. And sadly, I have to say this. Those without Christ aren't the only ones who are not submissive to God. Even Christians sometimes refuse to be submissive to their maker. God works in our lives and wants to change us and give us the power over sin in our lives, but sometimes we're stubborn like an old mule. Sometimes God decides the best thing for us are some trials to mold us and make us more like his son. And often we stubbornly resist the trials. Sometimes we ask him to do something for us. And in his infinite wisdom, he, his answer is no or not now. And we don't want to submit to his will. And so we stubbornly go forward as if we think we can make it on our own without his blessing. And sometimes the Lord will ask us to do something. Maybe get involved in a particular church ministry. Or maybe just uh, be of service to someone. And we don't do it because we don't want to be inconvenienced. Folks, that's a bad move. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore uh, to God. 
Christian friend, God wants to take full control of your life and be your master. And he wants you to submit to him in all things. And my prayer is that every one of us would learn to be just like that little donkey and submit to God. We would be so much happier and we would save ourselves so much heartache. Remember what the old hymn says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And so there you have it, three examples of submission. Jesus was submissive to the will of the Father. Jesus was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The disciples were submissive to the will of the Savior. The, the disciples obeyed Jesus' instructions, even an odd one uh, uh, about securing a donkey for him. And the stubborn little donkey was submissive to the will of the Creator. He obeyed the King of Kings. And so how about you? I wonder, have you submitted to God's command to believe on Jesus and be saved. And if not, then why don't you bow your head with me right now and join me in this simple prayer of receiving Christ. Get this matter settled this morning. Uh, join me in this prayer if you would. Lord, I know I'm a sinner and that I deserve condemnation. But I accept your free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins so I could be forgiven. And I believe Jesus rose again so that I could have eternal life. I now receive him. I place my faith and my trust in him alone as my Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me this morning, I have some good news for you. You have the solemn promise of God in John 3, verse 15, where it says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That promise is yours to claim forever. Now, if you joined me in that prayer, would you do me a favor and let me know? Because I would love to rejoice with you in your newfound faith in Christ. You can contact me several ways. You can comment right here on my Facebook page or on the church Facebook page. Or you could write to me, Pastor Brian Speroni, Pasco Community Baptist Church, Pasco, Rhode Island, uh, and that's 111 Church Street, Pasco, Rhode Island, 02859. Or you could email me at B-R-Y-P-A-M-S at Juno, that's J-U-N-O dot com. Or you could just pick up the phone and call me, 401-568-4963. I would love to hear from you if you prayed along with me this morning. Now before I close, let me just say this to our church family. I love you and I miss you. Boy, do I miss being able to fellowship together with you. And hopefully it won't be too much long before we can get together again. But just a reminder, I love you. I'm praying for you. I'm here if you need me. Just contact me. And next Sunday morning, we'll gather again, 10 o'clock on my Facebook page. And I will be bringing a special Easter morning message. But in the meantime, let me just remind you of this. As a Christian, be submissive to the will of the Savior, and tell somebody about Jesus. God bless you.